And so we move now to the Transport Board and I invite Senator Ian Gooden Edgel, sorry, Comrade Ian Gooden Edgel to address you. I'm pleased to know that he is speaking solely on the Transport Board. Good afternoon, comrades. Good to be here at this, the 81st annual conference. First of all, let me express thanks to the um, organizing committee for inviting us uh, here. I want to thank you very much. Uh, I think this is very refreshing. I'll go straight to the transport board. Um, it's one of uh, two hot potatoes, I believe, that I have been entrusted to carry. But on this occasion, speaking to the transport board, I want to also thank the directors. Oftentimes, the chairman is highlighted, but not the directors who sit in the very boardroom with me, uh, working hard in the best interests of Barbados. So I want to say thank you to the directors who, who sit us. Just a brief um, overview of the uh, transport board. What we've encountered, and this is perhaps no secret, is a situation where the bus fleet is very aging. In fact, um, I'll take you back um, to some 24 years ago when the transport board had purchased 100 buses. You recall that it always falls to this Barbados Labour Party, the party for and behalf of the people, who would always have to jump in and fix public transport in Barbados. And on this occasion, it's no different. Uh, we would have bought 100 buses back in the day when the Barbados Labour Party came to office early in the 1994 period, when we recognized there were less than 50 buses on the road. Um, 19 years ago, we would have procured another 110 buses. 16 years ago, we would have purchased another 30. And then 13 years ago, we bought another 70 buses, a combination of 65 what we call the regular buses and five for the disabled community as we instituted a new fleet replacement policy. So that at the end of 2019, the average age of the transport board fleet is 18 years old. And sometimes people, when you see um, buses passing by you and passing your homes and on the highways, you can look to those buses and you can see that those buses are 20 plus years and they're still in operation and working hard. But what had happened is that when in 2008, when the Barbados Labour Party demitted office, the average age of the fleet was seven years old. And I want you to take this into consideration. When the Barbados Labour Party left office, the average age of the bus in 2008 was seven years old. In 2013, it was 12 years old. And like I said, the average fleet now is inching up 19, 18 years going 19. So the challenge has been and continues to be that whenever you refuse to adhere to a fleet replacement policy, whenever you refuse to buy buses, and not in large quantities, because you should be buying buses in accordance with the fleet replacement policy that your party, the Barbados Labour Party, left back in the day when we left office in 2008. If su the, the succeeding administration had adhered to that bus purchase, the transport fleet replacement policy, the transport board would not be in the position it finds itself in today, and I want to make that clear. But I also want to tell you that when I was called and a meeting was requested and I was offered the opportunity to chair the transport board, never in my wildest imagination, I thought that I was going back to a board that I left a long time ago. I said, well, it's time to move on and do things. But when I was asked, of course I said yes. Because at the end of the day, I have a car, you have a car. But there are several persons out there who rely on public transport. And there's no way that this great political party, the Barbados Labour Party, could let down the very people who had voted for us and, had ex and expect better of us and want us to do the things that we know we can do and do well. And when I got that call, of course I said yes. But what have we done as a team at the Transport Board? I assume leadership on May 1, as you know, and immediately, I went ahead and I had a plan of action. An action plan is what I set about to accomplish. 
I had separate meetings with the garages to understand and to keep partners concerned to understand what was happening. I had to change a few processes, processes that I shouldn't have to change, but the board went ahead and changed those processes, including the authorization of works to garages, to ensure that every cent that we spend in the transport board is accountable, is accountable and to ensure that the traveling public had an improved public transport sector. So we created a special fund. I asked the minister responsible, Dr. William Duguid. I spoke to the prime minister as well. And I said, the transport board will need a special bus fund to initiate action. We asked for the request through the ministry, went to the Ministry of Finance, went to the cabinet, and it was approved. And I thank the Ministry of Finance, the prime minister as well, for allowing us to get access to the $6 million program to refurbish buses that we know we were able to put on the road in the shortest possible time. So we had a special fund for the repair of buses. We review the assignment of buses. We also ensured that the work being performed was work that was absolutely necessary to the success of the transport board. Well, I see a board member present today and she will tell you that when I took to the wheel at the transport board, there was a lot of engagement. In fact, I think alone in May, we had about six or seven meetings and no joke. And we went in there because we had a clear plan of action. We had meetings and we did what we had to do as a board. So we had serious engagement. But one of the other, one of the challenges that I recognized was that we were not engaging. And I said, well, we got to start managing this message. So I utilized the media, made myself available. The press asked me questions and I answered. I didn't run from the press because it was impossible to run from the press in a small island when you're faced with challenge. But my simple message was to tell members of the traveling public, listen, we have a problem. I have a plan. I'm going to go to work and work hard for you because I understand when you have to wait three and four hours for bus, that's not easy. So we went ahead, we faced the press, talked to the people, managed the message. And ever since then, I would give an update on public transport in Barbados because I'm never afraid to put the facts on the table and to engage the public. So we managed, we managed, the, uh, we managed the, the, the message and we had strategic announcements in the press. I was most touched um, by a situation that I had encountered. I had gone to the Princess Alice Terminal unannounced as I normally do because you know when you lead an organization it's best not to be escorted but you walk in unannounced. So I drove to the Princess Alice Terminal after a board meeting and I parked and I walked through. And I met this lady from St. Lucie, didn't get her name, sorry I wish I should have but I didn't. And I saw the young lady in, uh, in the terminal and she was waiting the Princess Alice Terminal for a bus to go to St. Lucie. And she was saying to me that she had a three hour wait. And that conversation with that old lady incentivized me as a chairman, not only to go there and work hard on behalf of the traveling public, because I knew people like her were dependent upon national transport, and I therefore took it to myself. If I need any additional motivation, that gave me the motivation to go to work hard every day at the transport board to make a difference in the lives of people, and that is what we started to do. The second initiative was clearly to win back the confidence of the traveling public. You can't hide when there's a problem. You have to go there, you meet the people. But I think thus far, we are beginning. There's still a lot of work to do. There's a plan of action, we have it, we're working it. But there's still a lot of work to do. But we are gradually regaining the confidence of the traveling public. And people tell me daily, Whenever they look around Barbados, you see more buses than you saw in a very long, long time. In fact, I have a little bit of problem sometimes because sometimes we see some of them empty. But the reality is that we have more buses on the road than we ever had in a very long period of time. So we won back the issue of confidence. The other issue was that we had some challenges. We had a situation where um, we weren't using genuine parts, something I thought I had put to rest. Uh, many years ago when I left the transport board. 
And, and something that I, because I also recognize the former chairman of the transport board in the audience, your general secretary, Dr. Jerome Walcott. Something that we had put to rest long, to rest long time ago. But we had a situation where again, there was a purchase of non-genuine parts. The lubricants that they were using, they may argue and tell you that they were spending less money on lubricants, but they never told you the truth. They never told you that the lubricants that they believe were the cheapest were not necessarily the most enduring parts, uh, enduring lubricants, sorry, for the transport board parts. So we restore that. And as a result of the restoration of that very simple decision, you've seen a situation where the life of the transmission has been extended. So I really want to say thank you. I also want to say thank you to the Quality Assurance Department. Because when we got there, we saw a Quality Assurance Department that was effectively broken. We restored life in the Quality Assurance Department. What we did was that we allowed the Quality Assurance Department to fix and what we call to assist with the turnover or turnaround in the rolling defect. So if you have a minor repair, or many defect, as I would refer to it. And that defect perhaps will take you no more than an hour. Why should a bus go into a garage and wait for days when a core team could effectively fix the problem and put it back on the road within the shortest possible time? So I want to say thank you to the Quality Assurance Department. The other, the, 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 another issue that we had to deal with was the issue relating to schools. And you know, obviously, we have to get our children to school on time. And we know that required a number of buses. But we went to work with our plan of action to ensure that come September, I think it was September 9th, when the school term reopened, that the transport board would not be caught in a position of compromise and that the board would not have been criticized. When we told you we had 60-something buses on the road, I also had some buses ready for the school beginning of the school term. So that when you recognize the, big, the commencement of the school term had come and that there were buses on the road and you weren't getting as many criticisms. People said, wow, let me check and see if this is for true. In fact, the press also had their teams stationed all over Barbados and I'm happy that the press did so because what it, what it did for the transport board was to further assure the public that yes, we, the members of the transport board, were winning back the confidence of the traveling public. We had one minor hiccup with the Lodge School, but that was, I won't go into that now, but the reality is that we had buses on the road, and today we continue to maintain the school bus service. We might have a few challenges because everything is not perfect. It is not, we still have a long way to go, but we've just begun, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm assuring you, the members of this party and those within the hearing of my voice, that we have only just begun and that the transport board will win back your confidence. As part of the action plan as well, we also had uh, key objectives. One of the things I did as chairman, that we had a weekly meeting with the with some suppliers and suppliers of parts and so on. And we did that. And we set objectives. And the reason why we set objectives essentially was to ensure that we had buses on the road at a given time. And those objectives worked well for us. We also had a situation where we, had, we have an internal auditor. And I knew before that they had some challenges because leading up to the last election campaign, we made those issues known in the public domain as an opposition party. But when I got there, I was happy that they had an internal auditor. But we set the internal auditor to work to ensure that the issues that you saw that were published in the Auditor General's report didn't happen again. So we have an internal auditor who, when we have the special repair program, that he would go through and check to ensure that every invoice reconcile to internal process that we have, that we established, and also to ensure that we were spending the money exactly as I promised the cabinet of Barbados that we would do, that we were allocated by bus, and that is his job, and he's doing a great job there. We had to um, execute a search for a general manager. We now have our general manager on board. Um, he's on board for two months going now, and obviously with a new general manager, 
It takes time to understand the, pro the procedures, uh, but he's hit the ground and running fast, and he's of great support to the transport board. I also want to extend my gratitude from a personal level to Ambassador Dr. Clyde Maskell. Dr. Clyde Maskell, from the time I was announced as chairman, he said, Ian, I am willing to work with you if you will have me. And he said, Clyde, without doubt. And Clyde, Dr. Maskell, has been there with us. And he's been there with us every step of the way. He's given us wise counsel. He's gone in there. He got his information, I call it, and he would refer to his transport economics. But that worked well for the transport board because you had a fresh pair of eyes looking at public transport, somebody who can just analyze matters for us and suggest a path. But who went in there? Not thinking that he knew everything, but went in there and worked with the management. And they will all tell you that he has been of tremendous help. And I want from this very podium to say thank you, Dr. Masco. <laughs> so our job number one was increasing bus availability, and we're increasing bus availability. I want to take you quickly through to the future. But like I said, this is only the beginning. So I intend, once we get bus availability up to the required standard, that I can have a dedicated school bus service for the country. And we will do it. And it can be done. And I know how many buses. We are also going to move to a situation where we're going to have a cashless system, what you refer to as an automatic fare collection system. You have this issue of fare boxes. But I want you, in modern times, that you can go and buy, uh, you can download an app, and that you can buy um, a, 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 a bus fare on your app, and that you can go to the bus, and that you can tap, or you can present your phone as an app, and that you can pay for your ride. We also are going to work hard, like I said, at maintaining and stabilizing bus availability. We also have to ensure that we procure some new buses, but I will not speak about that on this occasion. But we are going to adhere to the fleet replacement program for the transport board. We have already established um, committees to work with us on several fronts. And again, it's about deepening the process of decision making within the transport board as we go forward from strength to strength. Um, I would also want to say that we've done, notwithstanding our cash flow um, challenges, we've also had to manage the profit and loss statement. And we're doing, as a team, an exceptionally good job. So uh, we're also working on an enfranchisement model where we want to integrate workers in an enfranchisement model, and we will do that. And like I say, we will also have, we are going to bring new technology where we allow you to know when the next bus is likely to arrive and how best you can follow departures as we move through. One thing that I'm very focused on, and I have to wrap up, is the creation of a sinking fund. The government did the transport board justice when it removed all the loans from its balance sheet. So it's up to us now in terms of a p and profit and loss management to go ahead now when we get a new fleet to start setting aside any extra cash in a sinking fund to fund the purchase of buses down the road. And that is what we intend to do. Now, I would, want, I would wish to go on and on, but I can't. So I believe I have a signal. But there are other issues that we have to address, and we are going to address them. And I'm sure that this will not be the first or last time. But you know, I've only been on the job now, well, come October, it'll be six months. And it feels as though that I would have been on probation for the last six months if we were working for another employer. But I must tell you, it's been a long ride. It's been a, a process that required tough decisions. But we made the decisions. We did a good job in trying to win back the confidence of the public. But we also did a better job in trying to stabilize, stabilize bus availability. When I joined, the bus availability was hovering on 33 buses. Today, we are moving in the right direction, and I'm confident with the continued support of the ministry, with the minister responsible for the ministry, Dr. Duguid, the members of the board of the transport board, management and staff, and with the support of the Ministry of Finance and by extension, the cabinet, we will accomplish a lot more. And like I said, this is but, but just the beginning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Agile, um, 
I, I congratulate you on a very good presentation and just now, um, which was focused on the social responsibility of the government um, providing um, transport to the um, general public. But there is one question that has been bugging me for a long time, and that is when the Prime Minister made the presentation and she said that in 2018, uh, the, the revenue was 20 million in 2018, and the expenses were 63 million, and that the government had to, there was a deficit of 43 million, and the government had to put that 43 million into the transport board. Um, it makes me wonder how long um, has the government been having to do, put that deficit into the transport board? Because it seems as if um, the expenses have always been more than the uh, revenue coming in. Um, what I want to know is if you all have been looking at the options of um, um, increasing the revenue, bringing down the expenses, and also um, the, the, pr the public-private partnership that you could also um, look at with regards to the transport board. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, but you would be aware, I think you're referring to the subsidy. I think that's what you're speaking to. Uh, the government, uh, the end of the last financial year, had, I believe, um, given the transfer board a major subsidy. And the issue has been because the revenue is driven essentially from general passenger revenues and uh, welfare and people who ride on the bus, especially um, our seniors and so on. Uh, but yes, the issue has been for a long time the revenue stream. You recall there was a revi there was a revision to the tariff, and bus fares went up. And as a result of the fare increase, the transport board is now positioned to get out there and manage its own affairs. Now, we have commenced um, the reduction of expenditure that has been going on. Before I got there, before I joined last May, uh, the board had a plan in place to reduce expenditure, that is ongoing. The issue has been that if you don't manage the PNL, you will always have some challenges. But we are now managing the, PN, the profit and loss statement in such a way that we believe, and making decisions that we believe will lower government's uh, contribution. In fact, with everything is happening, we will only be allocated a fixed amount, and we can't go beyond that. So we have to manage what we have. So to answer your question directly, we are working hard to reduce our expenditure while it's maximizing revenue. Two questions, Mr. Chairman. The first question is, does it make economic sense in this hard day to be refurbishing an old fleet which have a very short shelf life? The yes. second point, sir, Do you want me to ask that I should first? add, I let, me, let, me, let me answer that one first, sir. I can answer that one right away. The issue is, um, you have, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the chassis of, the, of the, the buses that we have. Absolutely nothing wrong. We have good buses. We have buses on the road that are more than 20 years old. The uh, issue comes if you are not servicing the buses, and that was a problem. The buses weren't being serviced when accordance with their schedule, maintenance. One, you have a situation, we, we have a, 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 what I refer to as a new power train unit. And it's the same bus that's 20 years old, right? We have added a new power train unit, and as a result of that power train unit, our maintenance costs on a trial basis thus far, it's saving us 50%. So to your point, it does make sense to refurbish some of the buses. But if you refurbish them to go with a new power train, it does make sense. I'll give you another example. With a bus or before the power train, you would, you would have to change brakes maybe every four to six weeks. We had a new power train unit, and we haven't, had we, have, we haven't changed the brakes yet. And we are running that bus now for a prolonged period of time, for more than four months. Can, so, you, can you draw to conference attention, sir? What are the findings today since the transport board 
had called in the, the police for an investigation into, mother, into the matter of either money lost, strayed, or stolen. And since then, since the police were called, can you let us know how far they are in the investigations? Right, I, I want to thank you. Okay. Um, no, I can't, I can't answer that one. The matter, with, the matter is currently with the police, and, and I can't do it. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Edgel. I'll, ke I'll keep it very brief. I, I'm not going to be controversial. At least I don't think so. Okay, great. You spoke about cashless uh, method for the commuters to be able to get on board the buses. Is this credit, debit, or M money? And I also wanted to know if you can expand on the sinking fund being able to use to, to procure more transport. The, the um, cashless system will have multiple options. Debit, credit, you name it. They will have, it's multi-functional and it will have what we call multi-purpose use. Uh, the sinking fund, uh, on, the next, on the next occasion we buy buses, we will start allocating revenue uh, because we will realize some savings from the, uh, the next fleet we purchase and we will allocate a sum internally and we will pledge that into a sinking fund to help with any future, purchase, any future bus purchase. Thank you very much.